Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Johnson, and here we are at the office at uh, St. John's Lutheran in uh, Royal Illinois. It's the week after. Uh, it's the week after Easter. It's the sixteenth of April, and the text we have actually takes place a week after Easter Sunday. Uh, the story is a very famous one that many, I guess, we many of us have heard this forever. It's about the guy named Doubting Thomas. Um, we know the story. I'll just, I want to go through this right away. This is really, this is a painting that shows the event that's depicted in the, te the text for today. Uh, this is Thomas. Obviously, this is Jesus, and these are two of the disciples. This passage, uh, it takes place in John chapter 20, verse 19. Uh, last week we finished, obviously I made a mosaic out of this. I just I just enlarged these pieces. This is uh, done by a man named Caravaggio. This was, print, this was painted in uh, 1601. There was another copy of it, 1602. And uh, they're both basically the same picture, a slight difference. This one is probably a third larger than the one that you see in front of us now. It's probably, it's, it would have been probably another... Uh, 10, 12 inches higher, and probably another 15 to 20 inches longer. It's a beautiful painting. The reason I'm showing this is because when I saw this as a, when I was in um, art school, I was fascinated by the lighting and, and the gesture here. It's a powerful painting. Um, I, I could have shown you just this, you know, and you could sort of squint and maybe see it, but this is... Uh, this is actually larger than life. It's, it's called a heroic because it's larger than life. What you see here is um, this is Thomas, and he's got, and I didn't notice this until the commentary was, he's got dirt under his fingernails, and his, and his, uh, his tunic is ripped. I mean, he's, he's, he's a poor man. Well, let's get to the story, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go back and sort of lead you to what happens when this takes place. Okay, here we go. Um, this is the passage. It's from uh, John chapter 20, verse uh, 16. Uh, what I'll do is I'll go through this. You may want to grab your Bible wherever you're at. Just grab it and come along and, and uh, take a look. I think uh, if you read along, I'm going to unfold some of these pieces bit by bit. It's a very, it's a very, it's a great story. And I've read this story dozens of times. Um, Let's begin. Um, we ask that the Lord would guide our hearts and our understanding as we read this passage for what it could reveal to us. Because, Father, we know that there's a lesson there for us today. And I'll just start out with this. This story is about Thomas, but the bigger story is about how you and I are like Thomas. Because he doubted and we always doubt because we weren't actually see there. We weren't actually to see this take place. But we have some skepticism because we didn't see it. So there's always going to be a bit of doubt. And I'd like to sort of tie that in at the end of this message. Okay, it's being in chapter, John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now check this out. I'm not going to go through the whole passage uh, all at once. I'm going to go through it and then just um, make commentary at each, at each part. Um, as, they, as they went through this whole day, uh, they were nervous. They were scared. Remember, this is Easter Sunday when this passage takes place. We haven't got to this scene yet. This is at the end of today's reading. But before that, on the first day of the day that Jesus was raised, the disciples were scared. They were hiding. They'd locked themselves in. And all of a sudden, Jesus appeared to them. And then he says to this, now remember it says, uh, out of fear, for fear of the Jews, they locked themselves. And Jesus came and stood them and said, peace be with you. Now remember, these guys had been with Jesus for three years, three and a half years. And when Jesus says, peace be with you, because he is who he is, when he says, peace be with you, People are at peace. Uh, we know when he says, peace be with you, the, the, the storm calms. The waves cease to 
be threatening. So when Jesus says, peace be with you, indeed there is peace. And then it says in verse 20, and after he said this, after he said this, he showed his hands and his, showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw Jesus. Now, that's a big comment to make. They were overjoyed. Um, now, obviously, this is being recorded by John. I mean, this could have been John in this picture. We don't know. Uh, I always tend to think that this guy, this guy right here is probably Peter, but we don't, we don't know. It's not designated by the artist. But when they say they're overjoyed, what would that be? Now, I can't help but think that when they saw Jesus and it says they were overjoyed, they probably had, like you and I, we have immediate recall of relationships that we have with people when we see somebody uh, comes in from overseas, they get off the plane, they get down, we see them, we, we just go, we're pretty excited because we have a background history with them and we immediately recall times of festives or uh, joyous times. And I put the, I jotted these down. When it says they saw him, when they saw the Lord, they were overjoyed. When they uh, noticed him, when they recognized him, when they remembered him and all that he meant for them, they were overjoyed. And I was thinking, and I mentioned this last week, some of them may have recalled, they remembered the sense that when they saw that boy, the, the dead boy at Nain was, was revived and they looked at the dead boy, they were amazed. And when they glanced at Jesus, the smile on his face and the countenance in his, his demeanor, that stayed with them forever. We didn't have that, but they did. Uh, when they were... <laughs> You remember that story when he fed the 5,000 and the other one where he fed the 4,000? You know, the first time they fed him, they went, whoa, this, this is amazing. Look what he's done. And then when he did it the second time, they're like, why do we ever doubt? Of course he can do this. This is what he, this is what he does. This is who he is. And then remember that time it says that he walked on the water? They were scared silly. They were just terrified. They thought they were going to drown. And here comes this Jesus walking across the water, and they're terrified. And Peter opts to get out of the boat. And they're going, no, don't do that. You know, that's crazy. And as soon as Jesus gets into the boat, the waves calm. Now, when the waves calmed, what did those disciples do? They themselves couldn't believe it. And I have the sense when Jesus showed himself to them for the first time on that evening, and he says, peace be with you, and they were overjoyed, there was this, this calm that rested upon them. Again, and it says this in verse 21, uh, again, Jesus says, peace be with you, a second time. Then he says, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now that's a really cool phrase to remember because all these disciples, there was at one time in the previous, uh, the previous period, the previous year, he had called them out. He said, I'm going to send you out in the group, this group of 70. They're going to send you out two by two. We're going to send you to all these places. And this is what I want you to do. And they all knew what happened when they were sent out. And it says, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, meaning as, as he was called to go and do what he did, I'm now going to send you. And I can't help but think there was this profound excitement like, we know what you've done, Jesus, and you're going to send us out that way. Now, maybe this is too much to cram into this passage, but I don't think so. Well, I say that because these men, as profoundly sorrowful as they were, 10 minutes before, the door was locked and all of a sudden, you know, they were, my, I sensed that Jesus had been dead, uh, died on Friday. This was probably 48 hours later. Now, we do know that Peter had gone, he'd gone to the grave that morning and he was told that Jesus had come back to life, but he came back here and said, it said they were still fearful. So when he came back and they were still sitting there, when Jesus showed up, 
inside this locked room, there again was this profound sense of great joy. And then when Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but the word for send is the word apostello, meaning apostle. So he is actually naming them, you are now apostles. You are the sent ones. Uh, the sent ones mean those, those people that are going to go out and do those things that they had seen done before. At this point in time, as he's sitting there in that room and he's looking at them, they can easily recall the boldness and the strength and the confidence that they've had built up over time. As they sat in that darkened room, it could have been dark, I don't know, maybe there was some, maybe the, uh, a bit of candlelight, maybe there was m much light, maybe, maybe his divine countenance because he was the risen Christ, maybe he glowed and there was an eminence that filled the room, I don't know. But as they sat with Jesus, they saw the divinity uh, incarnate. They saw the divinity right there showing as and glowing as the risen Christ. But they also recognized his body and they recognized the things that he had done. And then he says this. This is what it says in verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. They had known about the Holy Spirit. And we do know that the Holy Spirit um, comes at Pentecost, which is 40 days, 50 days later. But right now, the Holy Spirit has been, has been placed upon them. It says, he, it says he breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The word breath means, uh, it actually means uh, pneuma. It means the breath comes out of him. Now, I know this is, this is beyond our capacity to understand this. Maybe slightly so we can understand it. We have heard stories about, and we've actually met people that have, a uh, person has been rescued, they've been brought up uh, from drowning, and they're brought up, and a person puts their mouth over the, the person that has been, has been drowned, and he actually blows into it and causes their lungs to move. This is exactly the same word when God created, well, not the same word in Hebrew, but the same idea when God created the first human. Can you imagine the first human, Adam, just... <sighs> this idea is so, so amazing. Imagine all these guys sitting around there and he, Jesus just <sighs> breathes on them. And all of a sudden... There's this striking awareness of all the details in the room, not just the recall of a memory that they had with Jesus, but the fact that all of a sudden there is this profound sense of the divine that has come, has come within them. It's a new breath. Maybe, maybe in a way you can, you can imagine that uh, you're kind of short of breath and you, you can kind of catch your breath or you walk out into a, a, a fresh day and you can, you can feel the, 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 the wind coming at you and you, you get that new breath, maybe so. But it says when he breathes on them, they receive the Holy Spirit and the response and this new way of thinking comes to them. And so there's this freshness and there's this newness. New, newness. And then it says this, this is verse 23. It says, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 23 says, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Jesus is telling them the precise thing that they're able to do. But this was actually a charge brought against him when he had forgiven someone. Because a Pharisee came trotting up and said, can't do that because only God can forgive. And Jesus, as human, he said, because he, he, do, he knew that he had that capacity, he had been, given, been granted that, that ability, he could forgive sins. And now he says this to these humans. 
And he says, if anyone, if any, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. And if you forgive them, if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That capacity, which we and the Lutheran Church would call that the office of the keys. So that has been granted. Now that's what happened to the eleven or the ten disciples that were there, and we know that Thomas was gone. The next verse shifts gear, kind of a. It's in high gear with these guys. It's in high gear, but now it goes down to a lower gear, kind of, it's kind of, I don't know, when we were learning to drive the truck, we call it granny gear. It gets really cool. You get a little, a, a lot of traction, get a lot of, uh, a lot of grip on the ground. Because now this guy comes in, this is Thomas, and we are like Thomas. Because Thomas doesn't believe. You know, this is what it says. Now Thomas, uh, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Now imagine, when they said, we have seen the Lord, they had visual contact. Not only did they see him, they heard him, they were breathed upon. He had made these pronouncements over them. So they had this full, complete excitement. But Thomas wasn't there. That wasn't clicking with him. It wasn't registering upstairs. It was like, oh. and you remember that old saying about a guy from Missouri? You know, Missouri, you know what it's called? You know what the nickname for Missouri is, don't you? It's called the show me state. You got to show me. You got to show me why that's real. Um, there's a really good story about why it's called the show me state. I won't get into it. But Thomas wanted to have evidence. And that's like us. We can't go back and reclaim that. But we have evidence that's around us which I'm going to explain in a minute. But let's get to this image and see what Thomas and see how Thomas responds. Thomas says, "Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it." Now, I don't think Thomas was there when they plunged the uh, the spear into Jesus' side. But that story was recounted to them. In, in classic detail by John because he watched all this stuff. And I can imagine when John went back to the, uh, to the, to that room where they, where they stayed hidden for those, for those hours, for that all day, all day Saturday and um, all of Sunday, all that story was recounted. So when Thomas says, I want to put my finger in his side, because that's, that's really going to show me the truth. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And so again, that automatic peace was just, it was like a, a mantle that was draped over their shoulders. Now I say that because the Lord can do that for us as well. If we ask him to give us that peace, indeed he will. Lord, give us that peace. Then he said to Thomas, because he knew was keenly aware what Thomas had said the previous week. He says to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now, doubt is not a bad thing. Um, doubt simply, it's a, it's a request. It's, a, it's an affirmation of what we want. We know to, we want to believe it. Please convince us. And Jesus comes up immediately and he says, he replays for Thomas the words that Thomas had said. Now take a look at this image. I really like this image. We're not sure how old Thomas is. This depicts him as a rather, looks like he's an old man. I think he's probably under, probably under 30 years old. But look at his hands. This is Jesus' hand. There's Jesus looking down, looking at, is he looking down here? Is he looking at, these guys are looking over Thomas's shoulder. And Jesus has his hand right here. This is Jesus' hand. And he's, got, right, he's wrapped it around Thomas's uh, wrist. What is he doing? Is he guiding? Now, this is just a pain. We, we, this is not scripture, okay? This is not scripture. But look what he's doing. He's guiding Thomas's finger into his side. I want you to believe this. Is he guiding it in there or is he restraining it? Is he causing, is he holding it there? Has he grabbed Thomas's hand and pulled it towards him? 
Say, come on, Thomas, trust me. I want you to, I want you to get inside me. I want you to feel the flesh right here. See where Thomas's fingers are? He feels the flesh around the wound that's in Jesus' side. What would that be like? You know, when I saw this painting as a young man, I was absolutely fascinated with it. And I still am. Because I'm thinking, uh, you can tell right here, take a look at his, his hand to the sides, almost gripping, gripping his, his upper leg. And these guys, I want to be that excited. I think we are that excited when we realize that Jesus has come and he's availed himself to us. But I, I digress. Let, let me just go on. And Jesus told him, because, and, excuse me, and he said to Thomas, put your finger here, reach out your hand and put it in my thighs, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Now, we don't know that he actually put his finger in Jesus' side, but the profound impact was that his belief was fixed and solid at that moment. Jesus says, and I believe there's a reason why that occurred for you and I. I believe this happened so that you and I would read this passage and we would, we would come to this realization because this is what Jesus says. Because you have seen, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We never saw this. We never saw this coming. We simply heard a story that was told by someone that told the next person, that told us through the generations, like it says in first in Second Timothy 2, and somebody told somebody, and somebody told somebody, and we saw pictures like this, and we believe. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> he said, get this, blessed are those that have not seen and have yet believed. Jesus is saying, you and I are blessed if we believe this actually happened. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That has occurred. My guess is the people who would see this video and would see this see these kinds of paintings. Now, for many people, this is just a display of, you know, artistic skill. For me, it's a representation of an actual event that occurred and it gives and, it, and inspires me. I want to tell you just another slight example. I, I didn't see this, but I've heard about this. And it, what happened, it really, it really hit me uh, when I heard about this story. Um, we are different. We are different than this, Thomas. But we really, are, we really are similar because there are many people that aren't sure and they are suspect. There's a lot of people that you and I know that would say this is just a bunch of, it's a bunch of made up story. It's a myth. It's not really true. Well, there's a church in uh, New York City. It's called Center Church. Um, and there's a, there's a fascinating pastor. And he, uh, he has a lot of people that, that, are, that are naysayers. And they say this can't be true. And I, I heard about this. I, I actually took a class and we had, uh, there's a book called Center Church. It talks about how uh, he went there in 1989 and started something. He was from a, he was from a, a central Ohio and he went there and he decided, we, re we really need to go where there's this huge population center. So he took people to uh, the East Coast in New York City. And I'll make this quick. There are a lot of people that were skeptics. So he said, Bring them on. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Before our service starts, he brought all these people in and he said they, they could ask questions. Just ask any questions you want. And he would simply address their questions. Because they, if they wanted legitimate answers and they wanted to discuss the issues. And so he was willing to do that. And so before his services, I'm told this, I, I don't know this, I've just heard this report. What he did was he explained to people as best he could what the scriptures had to say. And after an hour, he excused himself and he went, up, he went to the rest of the, the other part of the church and gave the message for the day. 
And the comment was made, about 100 people showed up on Sunday mornings. Now, what would happen if you and I, and you and I played that role? If we believe this and somebody comes to ask us, are we going to tell anybody what we believe? Would we invite anybody to ask us? I think we should. I think that's why we're here. Isn't that what Christians are supposed to do? I, I think so. I know so. And so we are like this Thomas because once Thomas heard this, then he went out and told others. How so? Thomas, this guy here, he actually traveled from Palestine where this occurred. He went all the way to India and he's buried there. And years ago, about 15 years ago, Jackie and I went to the site where Thomas the Apostle is buried. It's right on the coast of the Indian Ocean. And he made it all the way there. Why? He was so convinced it was true. He spent the rest of his life telling people so. May that be said of us as well. Blessings to you. Let's finish with a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this example of Thomas. And may the same that was said for Thomas be said of us as we share the good news that we know. We may be stumbling a bit, but as we do know it, allow us to share it freely. We freely receive, receive we have received it. Let us freely give. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings to you. See you later. See you next week. Okay? Come on back. Take care. Bye-bye.